I have been to the place where the acacia tree does not grow, where the tree thick with leaves does not exist, and where the ground yields neither herbs nor grass. And I have entered into the place of secret and occult things, and I have spoken with Lord Set. I have travelled to the boundaries of the soul. The Lord of Jeddu has permitted me to come forth as a Bennu bird, that I may have the power of speech. I have passed through the river flood. I have made offerings with incense. I have been in Abydos in the temple of Satet. I have sunk the ships of my foes. I have been to Jeddu, of which I cannot speak. I have set the idol upon its two feet. I have seen the dweller in the holy place. I have entered Restatu. I have beheld the hidden things within. According to ancient Greek writers, the Egyptians of their time had records that went back much further than any historical records that exist today, spanning untold cycles of history. Indeed, the fact that farming in Egypt and stone monuments like those of Gebekli Tepe are almost 12,000 years old tells us that civilization as a whole is at least twice as ancient as any surviving records can tell. This is a sweet and enticing suggestion, but risks carrying us deep into a realm of speculation and imagination, so instead we will begin at the apparent beginning. The earliest evidence known to modern historians of a society with direct cultural continuity to the later Egyptians dates to around 4500 BC, and the remaining king lists of Upper and Lower Egypt go back at least nine generations prior to their unification. Beyond these, the surviving records refer to an unnamed series of demigods descended from Horus. There are other examples of similarly ancient civilizations, such as the Sumerians and the Indus Valley people, the distinction being that while those societies rose and fell into ruin and were confined to the vaults of history, the nation of Egypt endured. For later ancient peoples, Egyptian society and culture seem to be just like its stone monuments, timeless. It is not surprising, then, that Aristotle referred to the Egyptians as the oldest of nations. To get a visceral taste of this antiquity, consider the fact that Queen Cleopatra lived closer in time to the invention of the iPhone than to the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza. But what manner of country was Egypt? What sort of land and what sort of folk could give rise to such a venerable civilization? Both the land and the people of Egypt were expressions of extreme duality, stemming first from their location. The Egyptians called the Sahara Desert the Red Land, Deshret, the domain of the mysterious and destructive deity named Set, and haunted by countless otherworldly presences. Clinging to the banks of the Nile was the Black Land, Kemet, formed from the silt and mud deposited by the annual flood. This land belonged to a divine dynasty of royal gods, Ra, Osiris, and Horus, and their mortal successors, the Pharaohs. Every year, the timeless divine battle between Horus and Set was re-enacted and re-actualized by the very land itself, in the changing of the seasons marked by the rise and fall of the river, a harsh duality quite different from the four seasons of northern lands. Thus, the sovereignty and nationhood of Egypt was predicated on the Nile and its gifts, maintained by the royal gods. With highly sophisticated irrigation and agricultural systems, combined with a profound reverence and respect for the land and natural cycles, the Egyptian farmers could produce enough goods to sustain a huge and complex hierarchy of institutions while maintaining their human connection to the natural world, and through it to the metaphysical reality that underlies nature. This allowed for the development of high culture, philosophy, literature, and the iconic stone monuments that we can still see thousands of years later. The lifeblood of this vast imperial organism was the water of the Nile, without which the land and people would have long since been consumed by Set. Egypt was further divided into the southern Nile Valley that formed Upper Egypt, and the northern delta of Lower Egypt where the river split into many streams and met the Mediterranean. These two lands were originally inhabited by different tribal groups which, once united by the semi-divine descendants of Horus, were bound inseparably together. 
It was here, on the edge of two extremes, that the Egyptians came to understand Mart, the cosmic law on which all natural and human phenomena depend. Mart holds the balance, maintains the consistency of existence with mathematical precision, underpins every action and every reaction, and sustains the identity of each object. Without Mart, there is only formless chaos, symbolised as the primordial ocean Nun, and the aquatic dragon serpent Apophis. This holds true for human affairs as well as cosmic ones, for humans and our societies are microcosms that follow the same pattern as the whole of nature. In this sense, failure to adhere to natural law leads to social and spiritual chaos and destruction, just as the universe would fall apart if it were to stop obeying the natural laws of reality. Thus, Mart is the basis of both science and ethics. This concept is demonstrated in the instructional text called The Teachings of Ptahhotep, which portrays good and bad actions primarily in terms of order and chaos. If thou be a leader, as one directing the multitude, endeavour always to be gracious, that thine own conduct be without defect. Great is Mart, appointing a straight path, never hath she been overthrown since the reign of Osiris. If thou desire that thine actions may be good, save thyself from all malice, and beware of the quality of covetousness, which is a grievous inner malady. Let it not chance that thou fall thereinto. It setteth at variance fathers-in-law and the kinsmen of the daughter-in-law. It sundereth the wife and the husband. It gathereth unto itself all evils. It is the girdle of all wickedness. But the man that is just flourisheth, Truth goeth in his footsteps, and he maketh habitations therein, not in the dwelling of covetousness. They also emphasise objectivity and demonstrable truth instead of relying on preconceived convictions, showing that truth and justice are unified in natural law. If thou be the son of a man of the priesthood, and an envoy to conciliate the multitude, speak thou without favouring one side. Let it not be said, his conduct is that of the elite, favouring one side in his speech. Turn thine aim towards exact judgments. If thou wouldst be a wise man, and one sitting in council with his overlord, apply thine heart unto perfection. Silence is more profitable unto thee than an abundance of speech. Consider how thou may be opposed by an expert that speaketh in council. It is a foolish thing to speak on every kind of work, for he that disputeth thy words shall put them unto proof. Be not proud because thou art learned, but discourse with the ignorant man, as with the sage, for no limit can be set to skill. Neither is there any craftsman that possesseth full advantages. Fair speech is more rare than the emerald that is found by slave maidens on the pebbles. At the centre of every activity in Egypt was the temple, Temples were not like modern churches where everyone gathers to pray on Sundays, attend weddings and funerals, and otherwise neglect. They are administrative and educational centres with self-sustaining estates that served to hold the Egyptian government and economy together. Taxes were gathered and counted, official documents, records and correspondence were painstakingly copied, filed and distributed, and legal proceedings were carried out in front of legislative experts, all in the various buildings and courtyards that formed the temple complex, surrounded by farms and gardens that produced income for the staff. Attached to every large temple complex was a building called a House of Life, which served as a library and a university, where scribes were taught to read and write, and priests were taught medicine, astronomy and other sciences. Being a priest in ancient Egypt meant being an expert in technical subjects as much as being a good spiritual leader. As Egypt had its foundation in collections of primordial tribes, there were from the very beginning numerous conflicting cults and mythologies, and a different account of the gods and the universe was espoused in every city, town and village. They even showed a tendency to multiply rather than to reduce the number of their gods and goddesses by symbolising their attributes. As a result, we find it necessary to deal with a bewildering number of deities and a confused mass of beliefs, many of which are obscure and contradictory. But the average Egyptian was never dismayed by inconsistencies in religious matters, he seemed rather to be fascinated by them. 
primitive societies fully embody their mythologies and assimilate everything they experience to their particular narrative cycle, having a connection to the symbols and gods of their culture at a deep and subconscious level. With the rise of complex nations came the need to rationally interpret these disparate mythologies. The Egyptians were the first to understand these different belief systems as complementary and reflective of one another, even when on the surface they appeared to contradict. When two legends attributed the creation of the world to different gods, the Egyptian philosopher priest saw them as different perspectives. From the perspective of the Earth, the Sun and Moon both seem to orbit around us. If we shift our perspective to the Moon, then the Sun and the Earth both revolve around us there. The story in which one god creates the world is to be understood from the perspective of that god, with him at the centre of the cosmos, and serves to illustrate how this god's attributes relate to the world, while another story does the same for another god. Of course, this does not mean that the Egyptians did not give pride of place to various specific gods in different times and places, establish structured hierarchies, and even get into arguments over which god was superior, as we shall see. As we have indicated, the policy of the priests of the sun was to absorb every existing religious cult in Egypt. They permitted the worship of any deity, or group of deities, so long as Ra was regarded as the Great Father. The first thing that strikes one in Egypt is the sun. It is truly majestic, far more so than our northern sun which too often is limp and cloud-defeated. The Egyptian sun commands the lower atmosphere, permeating it with its brilliance. It is a regal presence that dominates the whole country. While in the vast majority of cultures, the supreme patriarch of the gods is represented by the blue sky, or clouds and thunderstorms, in Egypt, these things seem petty and trivial compared to the beams of the sun. Thus, the sun god was not only the king of gods, but also the god of kings. It was an important duty of the pharaoh to wake up before dawn and greet the sun as it rose, establishing his place as the terrestrial representative and herald of the god, rather than a tyrant beholden only to himself. The centre of the solar cult was the great temple at the city of Heliopolis. There, a sacred stone marked the place where the primordial mound of earth was first touched by the sun's rays at the beginning of time. This stone or mound, called Benben, was the proverbial centre of the world, or Axis Mundi, considered as an absolute fixed location and the standard by which all motions and directions can be determined. When the primordial mound was first illuminated by the sunlight, the Bennu, or Phoenix, perched on it. This bird was the soul, or Ba, of the sun god, and he had the power to rejuvenate himself whenever he died living in a constant cycle of death and fiery rebirth. This was only one of many different solar myths that were taught in this temple, which integrated various gods and traditional narratives. At Heliopolis, where archaic Nilotic and other beliefs were preserved like flies in amber, because the Asiatic sun worshippers sought to include all existing forms of tribal religion in their own, a creation myth makes reference to the one god of the primordial deep. This god was Artum, the transcendent sun. When Artum first awoke, there was nothing in existence besides himself and the dark abyss, devoid of form, and Artum was on the face of the waters. This will remind a modern viewer of Genesis 1, but from here an entirely different form of creation unfolds. Instead of creating the universe apparently from nothing like the biblical god, our tomb unites the masculine and feminine qualities within himself and begets the other gods from his own substance. In short, reality is presented as emanating from our tomb, just as light and heat emanate from the visible sun. This emanationist cosmology has radical implications for the nature and structure of reality, and by extension for how we human beings relate to the universe around us. In the creation ex nihilo model, there is a divine realm consisting of God only, and a separate artificial realm consisting of absolutely everything else. Within the artificial realm, the divine realm is essentially absent, and only by violating the normal order of things through supernatural miracles does the divine present itself. 
The things in the world are essentially profane and have no meaning in themselves, only obtaining meaning by having an equally artificial connection to God. In the emanation model, there is no artificial realm. The world and everything in it is an extension of the divine realm, forming a single, fully integrated whole. This means that the things in the world are inherently meaningful and share some of the divine reality that produced them. Another important element of this narrative is its appeal to monism, as everything stems from the one perfectly simple principle personified in Atun. This parallels the philosophical concept that we call Occam's Razor, which means that, all other things being equal, it is most reasonable to accept the explanation with the smallest number of assumptions. Monistic systems like this one begin with one simple principle and work outwards from there, whereas some other systems of thought begin with numerous unrelated assumptions. Considering the extreme duality of the Egyptian condition described earlier, the priests could easily have created a dualistic system similar to Zoroastrianism, but they seem to have insisted that the anti-divine chaos has no ontological reality, it is merely a void, just as cold and dark are not truly real, but are simply the absence of heat and light. Supporting this is the fact that Isfet, the Egyptian word for primordial chaos, is just an abstract term and not the name of an anti-god or demon, whereas Mart or cosmic order is a goddess. The association of the first cause with the sun is a natural one, as the presence of the sun illuminates and sustains the world, turning it from an apparently empty darkness into an intelligible image, and in many other traditions the sun is associated with creation and beginnings. As has been confirmed by experimental science in recent times, the physical sun is the ultimate source of all the energy in our surface ecosystems. Here we can see the intellectual sophistication of the Egyptian priests, who recognised in the visible sun's power a shadow or symbol of a superior kind of activity. But this is by no means the only symbolic power contained in the sun. Looking up from the fixed point of the Benben stone, the solar disk can be seen travelling across the vault of heaven and passing beneath the earth to rise again, its ultimate height changing at different points of the year. Likewise, the moon and stars spin and turn in traceable patterns, always converging on their point of origin in an endless cycle, like a serpent biting its tail. This circular motion is a living image of eternity. While it is not completely timeless, it also has no beginning or end, like the death and rebirth of the Bennu bird. The Egyptians had a word for this, Nechech, which indicates one of two distinct concepts of time which were recognised generally by pre-modern people. Neither of these concepts of time is linear, like our modern conception, which even contemporary physicists tell us is not actually real. In the modern world, we experience time as a set of uniform units, seconds, minutes, hours and so forth, which are all identical by definition, despite the fact that time is known to be relative. Ancient people experienced the passage of time in a very different way, which was attuned to the world rather than to arbitrary human measurements. Since throughout the year the number of hours assigned to the day and night remained constant, the hours of the day must have expanded in summer and contracted in winter, the season of coming forth, while the hours of the night contracted and expanded in reverse. Time breathed like a living organism. The god who rules over Nechech is Ra, the sovereign sun. If you have heard of any mythology from ancient Egypt, then you have heard of the cyclical journey of Ra across the sky and through the underworld, accompanied in his boat by gods who defend him from the great chaos serpent Apep. The path of the boat is a circle traced out by the sun each day, but this circle also rises and falls in a larger cycle that passes each year. The relative motions of the other celestial bodies along the same arc produced an elaborate harmony of the spheres, like a cosmic seven-handed clock constantly rewound by immortal Ra, and tuned by the intelligible laws of nature. Egyptian priests were keen observers of the night sky, using their knowledge of astronomy to plot out monthly and annual cycles of religious ritual, culminating in the new year marked by the rise of the river's floodwaters. The ancient Egyptians clearly had a good grasp of astronomy and were interested in using it to inform day-to-day -day decisions. Even as far back as 5000 BC, 
people in prehistoric Egypt were using astronomical tools to make such observations about the Sun and other celestial bodies. At Nabta Playa, an array of stones was erected which was aligned with several constellations and with the position of the Sun on the summer solstice. This would, among other things, allow the people using it to predict the rainy season and plan their activities accordingly. By constant observation and attention, the earliest Egyptians recognised correspondences between the celestial world of Ra and his retinue, and their own terrestrial world. As well as the Sun, historical Egyptians had a particular interest in the motions of the star Sirius, which was a living symbol of the goddess Isis. But this celestial imitation goes much further than any simple practical activity. So important to the traditional mind is the eternal cycle of time that the Egyptians edited their own history books in order to match up important events in the lives of their rulers with regular segments of the cycle. For traditional people, an event that happened once in the historical past is irrelevant, not worth thinking about, and effectively didn't even happen, except insofar as it actualises an event in the cycle, and therefore is not relegated to the past, but is actually recurring continuously. The purpose of the chronological records kept by the ancient Egyptians was not simply historical, in the modern understanding of the word, but was also metaphysical and symbolic. Their purpose was to organise mundane time so that it corresponded to heavenly sacred time. Besides the solar centre of Atum and Ra, other cosmologies prevailed elsewhere, seeking to convey different ideas and relationships through their own mythological cycles. Representatives of the groups of Egyptian spirits known as the Fathers are found at Memphis, where Ptah, assisted by eight earth gnomes called Knumu, was believed to have made the universe with his hammer by beating out the copper sky and shaping the hills and valleys. Ptah is a prototypical demiurge figure, a being with an otherworldly origin who constructs the physical universe from a spiritual blueprint. This is strongly connected to the concept of sacred space, as described by renowned historian of religion Mircea Eliade. In essence, the inhabited world, of which the human observer is at the centre, with the sky above, the underworld below, and boundaries to the north, south, east and west, beyond which lies the undefined chaotic realm, is seen by all traditional peoples as a representation of an inner reality. This inner reality is the universal blueprint, while the subjective material world is the product of the demiurge Ptah. This inner dimension is, of course, the symbolic or vertical dimension. What belongs to this dimension is not physical. Within it are located the non-physical aspects of objects that have an external mode of existence, and non-physical forces, energies and beings that may or may not become manifested in external space. Because the cosmos is built and established by Ptah, it is inherently connected to Ptah's own world through this vertical axis, the same axis mundi which in Heliopolis is connected to the sun, as the Bennu bird perches on the Benben. From this connection, it is possible to impose objective measure on the otherwise chaotic world, enabling orientation and the classification of objects, which would otherwise be impossible. In the Great Temple of Memphis, the text on a piece of stone known as the Shabaka Stone contains a section describing the creation of everything by Ptah. There comes into being in the heart, there comes into being by the tongue, something as the image of our tomb. Ptah is the very great, who gives life to all the gods and their cars, lo, through this heart and this tongue. Because the heart is seen as the centre of the human body, it is used as a symbol for the fundamental core of any object's being, which in a living thing corresponds to the intellect. The tongue, meanwhile, symbolises the expression of an idea in any form, hence why an image can be made with the tongue. So Ptah contains the immaterial form of Atum in his mind, represented by the heart, and then speaks the visible image of Atum into existence with his tongue. Lo, every word of the god came into being through the thoughts in the heart and the command by the tongue. Thus were made all labour, all crafts, the actions of the arms, the motion of the legs, the movement of all the limbs, according to this word which is devised by the heart and comes forth by the tongue and creates the performance of everything. 
there came the saying that Artum, who created the gods, said concerning Ptah Tenen, he gave birth to the gods. From him everything came forth, food, provisions, divine offerings, all good things. Here we see each class of beings, objects and forces in the cosmos beginning as an immaterial form in the heart of Ptah, before being expressed in this material world. The physical objects we see around us are descriptions, or artistic expressions, of these immaterial forms. This is the basic principle which underlies the science of symbolism, and is the basis for the Egyptian invention of writing, both of which we will address later on. Another notable feature of this passage is that the writer claims that Artum, the creator god of Heliopolis, also created the gods, but in a different way from how Ptah created them, revealing the Egyptian understanding of their contradicting myth discussed earlier. He placed the gods in their shrines, he settled their offerings, he established their shrines, he made their bodies according to their wishes, thus the gods entered into their bodies, of every kind of wood, of every kind of stone, of every kind of clay, in every kind of thing that grows upon him, in which they came to be. In this section, Ptah puts the other gods and spirits into physical vessels, shaping the matter so as to suit the nature of each. This tells us in what sense Ptah really creates the world. His primary activity is to infuse the abstract forms into matter, organising matter so that it goes from formless chaos into the structured order we can see. By his tongue or with his hammer, Ptah makes a tangible, symbolic copy of something that is otherwise impossible to express. This should suffice to demonstrate without any room for doubt that the mythical narratives created by the priests of Egypt were not the products of imagination or superstition, or crude attempts to account for natural phenomena by inventing superheroes, but instead were carefully assembled sets of symbols intended to convey these highly developed abstract concepts with extreme precision. But a modern person might ask, why did these ancient people, who had to concern themselves with surviving on a day-to-day -day basis, care so much about these internal realities rather than the external reality in front of them? To put it simply, the exterior reality is just that, a shell or covering. Without the corresponding internal reality, it is nothing but an empty husk and completely worthless. The Egyptians, as did all ancient people, saw through the covering and found that it is the surface of something real, deep and profound. The objects and beings that existed in inner space were regarded as more real than those that existed outwardly. They were often the source and archetype of the latter, as with space, so also with time. For the Egyptians, time also had an inner dimension. This category of time stands contrary to Nechech, the cycle of Ra. It is called Jet, and it belongs to the mummified god Osiris. Osiris rules over the invisible, supernatural underworld called Duat, having been slain by his brother Set. Like the preserved body of Osiris in the underworld, Jet does not change or move, but remains fixed, so it is sometimes translated as Eternity. Jet is also called Zeptepi, which literally means first time, or first occasion, the point at which time and causality begin. This is not improperly compared to the dream time, a point prior to normal time in which every single event in Australian Aboriginal mythology takes place, and all the landmarks and features of the world are created. In fact, the deeds of the gods in Egyptian mythology are said to take place within Jet, that is, simultaneously and instantly. Mircea Eliade describes the concept he calls sacred time as a single perfect moment that never passes or runs out, in which the processes that underlie chronological time are always happening and are never used up or spent. This sacred time initiates and renews the cycle of chronological time, restoring the dead Ra to life as he is carried through Duat and is reborn on the eastern horizon. The first time is the realm of metaphysical realities conceived in terms of symbolic images and myths. These are the patterns that are reflected in the mundane world and that need to be participated in if mundane events are to be filled with archetypal power. The events that take place forever in Jet are repeated constantly by nature in Nechech. 
Human actions, including religious rituals, creating and using technologies, medical procedures, farming, battles and wars, construction and the founding of towns and cities, are all repetitions or reenactments within Nechech of events that already exist within Jet, started by Osiris and his divine contemporaries. Osiris is also the god of rites, since he himself, first among all the gods, went through sacrifice and experienced death. His death and dismemberment by Set are related to his being the first to penetrate the unknown of the other world and to his becoming a being who knows the great secret. The myth is developed in the saga of Horus, son of Osiris, who resurrects his father. Horus finds the proper rites, Hu, and gives back to Osiris, who has gone into the other world, or properly speaking, into the supernatural, the form that he previously had. These notions of time and space may appear alien to us today, but they would have seemed normal and natural to almost everyone who lived before the early modern period in Europe, and even later among people from more primitive societies in distant places. They were not speculations made to explain away obscure aspects of the natural world, they were things that ancient people actually experienced firsthand, which the Egyptian priesthood was able to carefully analyse, categorise and articulate. If you had told an ancient Egyptian that time is a straight line arbitrarily divided into uniform sections, he may well have thought you to be insane. The modern consciousness has developed in such a way that access to this vertical dimension has become more or less closed off to it. For the ancient Egyptians, awareness of the vertical dimension was a condition of their experience of life, but today we are, to a large extent, shackled to a horizontal mode of perception from which the illuminating presence of the gods has been excluded. You are almost certainly aware that the Egyptians independently invented writing, in the form of pictographic hieroglyphs. They later simplified this system into a more phonetic alphabet called hieratic, or priestly script. Archaic people always put great stock in the power of words, as is attested by the survival of narrative elements dating back at least as far as the last Ice Age in the oral traditions of various cultures. But the introduction of writing radically changed how people relate to language. This impact is best illuminated by a document written by a scribe, on the topic of writing itself. Man perishes, his corpse turns to dust, all his relatives return to the earth, but writings make him remembered in the mouth of the reader. The book is more effective than a well-built house or a tomb chapel, better than an established villa or a stela in the temple. Be a writer, take it to heart, so that your name will fare likewise. A book is more effective than a carved tombstone or a permanent sepulchre. They serve as chapels and mausolea in the mind of him who proclaims their names. Is there one here like Hordedef? Is there another like Imhotep? None of our kin is like Neferti or Kheti their leader. May I remind you about Ptah Mejuti and Kharkeparasaneb? Is there another like Ptah Hotep or the equal of Kersu? Our scribe certainly makes a compelling point and the fact that we today know the names of Ramesses, Tutankhamun, Alexander and Cleopatra from ancient texts is a potent demonstration that his words are true, but there is another perspective on this matter which is rarely voiced. In Plato's Phaedrus, Socrates relates the story of an interaction between the pharaoh of Egypt and the god Thoth. Thoth had recently invented writing and wanted to teach it to the pharaoh, but the pharaoh was dismayed rather than pleased at this revelation. The pharaoh's contention was that people would believe they possessed knowledge because they had it written down, even if they couldn't remember it and thus had no way to implement it in their lives. In an oral tradition, there is very little room for useless self-help guides or escapist distractions, as societies that dedicated their collective memories to such nonsense would rapidly find themselves going extinct. In reality, these cultures dedicated themselves to word-for-word -word memorizations of enormous volumes of great importance, always in the form of extensive narrative poems containing multiple layers of knowledge and meaning in each scene. If you quoted a relevant line without any context, anyone hearing it would understand exactly what you were referring to and why. 
By contrast, our current time of widespread literacy is characterized by an overwhelming volume of mediocre, mass-produced media that gets forgotten in a matter of years. Sifting through this ocean of sludge in search of fragments of worthwhile treasure can be a daunting task in itself, especially when our methods of searching are under the control of those who have a vested interest in keeping us distracted and ignorant. Whatever the case, the name of this scribe, which presumably was written down somewhere, has now been entirely lost and forgotten. Though hieroglyphs may have made the words immortal, the oldest Egyptian texts actually predate the invention of writing. These texts, including those carved into the walls of monuments, begin with the words Jed Medu, words to be spoken, indicating that they were originally transmitted orally and spoken aloud during ceremonies long before anyone committed them to stone or papyrus. The phrase Jed Medu also appears on statues of gods, alongside the god's name, roughly translating to Ra says this, or Isis says this. Oftentimes this phrase is not followed by anything, indicating that the statue itself is supposed to be the speech or words of the god. The mixed form of their gods is nothing other than a hieroglyph, a way of writing not the name but the nature and function of the deity in question. The Egyptians do not hesitate to call hieroglyphs gods, and even to equate individual signs in the script with particular gods, it is quite in keeping with their views to see images of the gods as signs in a meta-language. To the Egyptians, a picture and a word were the same thing. A hieroglyph represents what it looks like in addition to a distinct abstract concept and a sound. In other terms, the visible, apparent object or image in the physical world is just what a word looks like when manifested physically. The Egyptian divine words, medu netur, hieroglyphs, constitute the entire visible world. If the universe is a manifestation, as the Egyptian term kheperu indicates, then all manifested noetic and material entities are nothing but the multiform images, symbols and traces of the ineffable one shining through the intellective rays of Deus Revelatus, the demiurgic intellect. The gods create everything by means of representations, images which reflect their noetic archetypes. That barley growing out in the field is a hieroglyph that represents one of the powers of Osiris. That crocodile basking on the bank of the Nile is a hieroglyph representing one of the powers of Sobek. When you look at the world around you, you are in reality reading a book written in symbols. But how can we reliably interpret this book to understand what it is about? From the standpoint just expounded, this question is meaningless. If the meaning is in the symbol, then it can be understood by studying the symbol itself, in the same way one can discover the physical properties of an object by studying the object. Berkeley was wrong to think that language is only a collection of arbitrary signs, when in reality there is nothing arbitrary even in human language, all meaning at its origin necessarily having its foundation in some natural conformity between the sign and the thing signified. Once we have seen that symbolism has its basis in the very nature of beings and things, that it is in perfect conformity with the laws of that nature, does this not authorise us to affirm that symbolism is of non-human origin? The fact that so many basic symbols are identical across numerous separate cultures strongly supports the position that meaning can be understood from the symbols themselves, not just imposed on them by our imagination. Thus anyone who is familiar enough with symbolism can extract the meaning from a traditional symbol he has never encountered before. Let us look at an example of a more complicated Egyptian symbol as explained by Iamblichus of Syria. The first Egyptian symbol Iamblichus describes is a god seated on a lotus. Iamblichus begins with the mud in which the lotus was rooted. Mud represented matter and all that is corporeal, nutritive, generated and subject to change. Mud was the primordial cause of the elements and was therefore pre-established as their foundation. The god of generation, however, wholly transcended his material powers. He was immaterial, incorporeal, supernatural and ungenerated. This god contains all things, though he remains separate and elevated above the mundane elements. This condition, Iamblichus says, is represented by his being seated on a lotus that separates him from the mud. 
The Lotus, therefore, functioned as the intermediary between the transcendent god and the material world, and Iamblichus says its circularity represented the god's intellectual empire for the circle was the image of the Gnos. Iamblichus's exegesis of this symbol outlines the itinerary of the embodied soul. Material and corporeal concerns were first balanced to establish a proper foundation, mud, the soul's intellectual capacities were then rectified, made circular, to create a receptacle sufficient to seat, i.e. activate, the anterior presence of the god. The hieroglyph symbolically portrayed the entire cycle of embodiment. The sceptical viewer may believe the viewpoint described here to be unscientific or detrimental to what is today considered practical science but it did not in any way prevent these people from producing scientifically accurate descriptions of the circulatory system and its function, discovering the use of penicillin mould for preventing infections, the use of honey for treating burns, the cauterization of wounds and the cultivation and use of yeast, nor from inventing papyrus, parchment, sundials, water clocks, looms, automatic water-powered mechanisms, siege engines, wind-powered sails, irrigation systems, siphons, screw pumps, and lever-based machines for moving massive blocks of stone, or from creating algebra, accurate estimations of pi and the use of the golden ratio, or using geometric instruments like set squares and protractors. For all of these things and innumerable others, as well as every subsequent invention that has come from a society benefiting from these, we have the Egyptian priests and scribes to thank, these facts absolutely oppose the idea that their conception of the fundamental nature of the material world was scientifically inferior to the modern one. In fact, the worldview of the Egyptian priesthood allowed them to technically apply principles from which modern engineers are entirely divorced. The highest centre of literature and technical learning was the House of Life attached to the Great Temple of Hermopolis. This temple and its city were dedicated to Thoth, the god of writing, science, ritual and magic, whom the Greeks identified with Hermes, hence the name of the city. It was in Hermopolis that the so-called hieratic art was perfected, the practical application of the knowledge of symbolism. They developed secret formulae for the exact ratios of materials and the perfect dimensions of the figures they constructed, for the purpose of more fully actualising the invisible form in the visible matter they worked. They laid out extensive and precise rites calling for specific combinations of chemicals, vibrations, heat, light and motion, in order to finalise the reception and animate the image. By animate, we do not mean that it would stand up and walk around, although the people who witnessed these statues may not have been at all surprised if they did. What we actually mean by animate is related to the Latin root of the word, anima, meaning spirit or soul, that which supports natural existence and activity. For the Egyptians, the anima in question is the ba, which refers to the individual attributes of a being. When a statue of a god is animated, it assumes the individual traits of the god, and it receives them more strongly the more closely it comes in form and substance to a perfect symbol of that god, like a radio carefully tuned to receive a particular signal. This creates a direct connection between the worshipper and the deity. Only when animated is the statue enabled to breathe, to see, to hear, and to speak in a subtle way, as a living image of a deity. By unveiling the face of this image, the god comes into manifestation, in the form of visionary epiphany, and by embracing the statue, the initiate worshipper is united with his archetypal lord. For archaic people who could see through the base matter into the reality it represented, these images appeared to be positively alive, displaying emotions, pronouncing messages, and imposing their unique attributes onto the world around them. The matter didn't need to move, it was nothing but a window through which the divine power itself could be seen moving. In fact, if the statue by some miracle actually moved, it would change shape and no longer receive the deity properly, instantly negating itself. This may give a credible sense to the odd stories in which statues created by Egyptian priests moved. They were perceived to be moving as devout Hindus or Catholics may also see their statues giving signs of life. 
and insofar as the supposedly physical world is a composite or idealization of common perceptions, why should we be surprised that some can see what others don't, any more than we are surprised that some of us cannot distinguish between red and green? The Egyptian nation had such a great reputation for creating superior animated images that even the Bible references their ability to make objects seem alive, such as in the Book of Exodus where Egyptian sorcerers supposedly turn their staffs into venomous serpents. In particular, this craft was more precisely associated with Hermopolis and Thoth, as later authors recounted fantastical legends of the countless magical statues that watched over the city. The Magi claim that Hermes was the first to build a kind of house of statues. It was Hermes indeed who built the eastern city of Egypt 12 miles long, wherein he erected a tower with four gates on its four sides. At the eastern gate he placed a statue of an eagle, on the western gate that of a bull, on the southern gate that of a lion, and on the northern one that of a dog. Hermes caused loud-voiced spiritual entities to enter them, Nobody could enter that tower's gates without the entity's permission. He set up various statues of every kind around the city, and by their power the inhabitants were made virtuous, free from sin and wicked idleness. This city was called Al-Ashmunayn, or Hermopolis. Could a modern engineer make a solid block of stone seem to be filled with such vitality and power as to drive witnesses to declare it alive and moving? Socrates confidently stated that all of philosophy consists of preparing for death. If that is the case, the Egyptians were the supreme philosophers. The preparations they made for death were so potent that they are known across the earth 4,000 years later. Not only the immense stone pyramids and secret hidden tombs, but the so-called books of the dead, more properly called the books of going forth by day. These texts form a map of the underworld, with detailed instructions for the soul of the deceased on how to navigate its various trials and tribulations in order to reach the palatial tomb of Osiris. From what we have already learned about Osiris and the Duat, the significance of this journey and destination should not be lost on the viewer. Preparation for death involves making a psychological journey from the transient world of appearances into the changeless world of real being a journey which the living practitioner of philosophy is supposed to be actively engaged in. This lends new meaning to Socrates' frequent invocation of Anubis, the Egyptian god of mummification. The aim of the philosophical life includes an ability to live well here and now, because the noetic background of one's very being is everywhere, and the ineffable one is always immediately present. Nevertheless, it culminates in transition, in Egyptian terms, to the Osirian realm, Duat, the alchemical body of the goddess Nut, heaven, sometimes represented as the macrocosmic temple in the form of a cow. Some persons may ask, if this is the case, then what really happens to me after I die? As we shall see, this is a foolish question, to which the proper answer is nothing. The real question ought to be, what do these events actually happen to? What is this thing which makes the journey from here to there, and what relationship does it have to the incarnate human person? In tradition, a distinction is made between true immortality, which corresponded to participation in the Olympian nature of a god, and mere survival. Also, various forms of possible survival came into play and the problem of the post-mortem condition of each individual was analysed, always taking into consideration the various elements present in the human aggregate, since man was far from being reduced to the simple binomial soul-body. The soul, as a concrete unit containing everything about an individual person, which exists forever after being created at some point in time, is the invention of a specific branch of early Christianity. It is a completely alien idea to every other culture and tradition in history, which in almost every case viewed living beings as consisting of several component parts which are not always connected. In the Egyptian case, the primary objects of which a human are composed are the khet, the physical body, the sa, the subtle vehicle, the ka, the animating vitality, the ba, the individual's particular attributes, the shut, 
the psychical shadow of the person, and finally the Ib, the individual essence and seat of intellect. As revealed by the papyrus known as the Dispute Between a Man and His Bar, the underlying forces that interact to produce a human can act against one another and create turmoil, something inconceivable unless we regard the particular attributes of a man as something entirely separate from his essence. Behold, my Ba is disobeying me, while I do not listen to him, is dragging me towards death before I have come to it, and is throwing me on the fire to burn me up, without him suffering therein. He will stay close to me on the day of suffering. He should stand on yonder side, like a praise singer does, saying, This is one who goes forth, as he has brought himself. My Ba is ignorant about easing the misery caused by life, and restrains me from death before I come to it. The vast majority of modern people identify themselves with their worldly appetites. They define themselves according to the physical things they like and dislike, the art they enjoy, their political stances, or even the shape of their bodies. All of these things belong either to the Khet or the Ba, the former of which is destroyed upon death, and the latter of which is destroyed during the so-called second death in Duat, which is the inevitable fate of all ordinary people. If this is the case, then the correct answer to the foolish question is that when they die, they cease to exist. The Ib of the deceased is swallowed by Amit, the Eater of the Dead. As a primordial reptilian chimera, she is an aspect of the natural, chaotic powers of the universe, which continuously consume and reproduce in vicious cycles. The various things that united to form the human are broken up and returned into this cycle, and it is by this that we can understand the following words of Herodotus. The Egyptians were the first to hold that the soul of man is immortal, and that when the body dies, it enters other animals, constantly reborn to existence. As Mircea Eliade meticulously demonstrates, Consumption by a giant monster is an important symbol in numerous cultures representing death and rebirth, commonly used in initiation rituals. According to Dr. Mark Mirabello, the purpose of the elaborate rituals, mummification processes and massive construction projects performed on behalf of pharaohs was to bind the various parts of their persona together so that they continue to be their living self after death. Without this binding, the deceased becomes unraveled and each part is recycled into something else. The heroes, or demigods, to whom the higher castes and noble families of traditional antiquity traced their lineage were beings who at death, unlike most people or unlike those who had been defeated in the trials of the afterlife, did not emanate a shadow or the lava of an ego that was eventually destined to die anyway. Instead, they were beings who had achieved the self-subsistent, transcendent and incorruptible life of a god. They were those who had overcome the second death. This is one face of preparing for death, but there is another which is more important still. Before the dead can pass into the Elysian field of reeds, they must have their heart weighed against the feather of Mart. If the heart is heavier, the great pyramids and canopic jars are proven worthless, and they suffer the same fate as their inferiors. So how can someone make their heart weigh less than a feather? Symbolically, material and generated natures are associated with earth and water, while immaterial natures are associated with air, fire and aether. The contents of the heart, which is symbolised as a cup or, in the Egyptian case, a jar, will determine its weight. In the Books of the Dead, the bar of the deceased actually identifies himself as Osiris, even when speaking directly to the real Osiris. This identification is not trivial. Osiris, as ruler of Invisible Duat and Everlasting Jet, is a representation of everything universal, immaterial and imperishable. All things that come into being in the manifest world come from the Duat. That is where they pre-exist before they are born into the light of day, and that is where they return after having relinquished their physical forms. By identifying with Osiris, the deceased is rejecting identification with those generated, transient things which are capable of dying. The truest preparation for death is in identifying with that which is changeless and cannot possibly die, not just acknowledging it conceptually, 
but actually experiencing this identification and living accordingly. Here we can see a prefabrication of the dying words of Plotinus the Egyptian, I am making my last effort to unite that which is divine in myself with that which is divine in the universe. After uniting with Osiris, the fully realized intelligence is finally transformed into an Ach, or Shining One, and is raised up to the celestial world of Ra aboard his boat of millions of years, something which would be impossible for a person whose heart is heavy with worldly attachments. All that we have discussed here, and a great deal more besides, was passed along the centuries from the most distant and remote of times, from the oldest of nations to their successors, to whom we will turn in subsequent videos. It may be that the greatest lesson the ancient Egyptians can teach us is that the Supreme Pyramid is not built out of stone. It is constructed brick by brick in the heart and on the tongue. At its summit is the centre of the world, where there is a boat awaiting us. Thank you for watching.